Okay, today's deep day. We're going deep into the what, what makes classical mechanics work. And in the process of doing that, we're going to just sketch a little bit about how car mechanics works and how they compare to each other. So let's get started. The uh, thing that we'll be messing with throughout this course are partial derivatives. I don't think I need to spend much time on this. You guys have all taken what's equivalent to calculus three in this university. And so you probably know that if you have partial derivatives of, of, of the, they're symmetric to the order. But still you're going to be teaching students and I'll just run very quickly through the uh, Beaver Lake Boathouse uh, geometry uh, of the partial derivative um, in just x and y. So let's go ahead and get with that fairly quickly here. But what I am really interested in having you learn right at the beginning is this uh, scaling that we looked at between the two ellipses um, and the uh, what I call the zeroth uh, Hamilton and Lagrange equations. And then uh, out of that follows the uh, first, uh, uh, both Lagrange and Hamilton differential equations of mechanics. And in the process of studying that, uh, we're going to uh, see a little bit of how um, just the fact that the speed of light is constant, really, really constant, all of classical mechanics and car mechanics falls from that in a logical way. I'm going to just sketch a little bit of that. That's unit 8, okay, of this uh, textbook that you have to receive, but you can look it up and you can also uh, take advantages of, of this, what I call chapter 0. We're hoping this will be chapter 0 for that great big uh, Springer Verloc encyclopedia, but it's, it's one of those things that could depend on uh, how, you know, how, how much space they have. In any case, that's uh, something that uh, I think you'll enjoy that, um, even if it's not completely explained. Anyway, the uh, contact transformations that uh, happen in classical mechanics. Very often, uh, mechanics books come out, particularly the American ones in which they talk about the contact transformation. They never explain why the word contact is even in there. That's something that's a geometrical effect, and it's effect that involves the wave mechanics behind classical mechanics, namely quantum mechanics. So we got a big day today. Uh, let's real quick here uh, go through the uh, Beaver Lake Boathouse, uh, in particular um, trying to figure out if you know where this is and Z, how do I find where this is, where I have to go two steps, say this way and this way, or let's try going the other way. And if the boathouse hasn't collapsed from a hurricane or whatever, um, this thing should be right at the same point that is. And by demanding that, you get the, the symmetry of the partial derivatives. Okay, that's, I think, is everyone sort of on, the, on that way, one can have seen this and think. So I can really zip through this without uh, hurting anyone. In any case, if, you're, if you are having trouble with this, I'll make sure you review it. So uh, there's the going up one way, there's going up the other way, and finally we get something where we meet at the middle there. And we compare them and see what you get uh, when you make that comparison. And that's when you get the result that we're after here, namely symmetry with respect to partial differentiation. So, okay. Now, just remember, and we're going to really remember this as we go through the mechanics today, when I say partial derivative with respect to x, and I'm in a thermodynamics book, some of the older ones particularly, uh, they might write the derivative that way, the way it should be in almost all math texts, but often they'll draw a line here and they'll list all the variables that didn't change. Okay. And for somebody that knows calculus, that's unnecessary. I, 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 I see these little curly d's, I know right away. It's, that's the variable that's allowed to change and the others have to stay still. But when you have a whole pile of variables, and you kind of have that in classical mechanics, so 
a little reminder uh, is needed. And then the whole idea of what it means uh, to um, have a partial derivative that's zero. Okay, that is, the thing doesn't depend on that at all. That's what we're going to wrestle with uh, as we go through this. But before we go on, there's a thing called the chain rule. You've all seen this too, right, in the calculus of those with the discussion of symmetry. Um, our notation for a time derivative just to save space, and it's a little unfortunate because uh, sometimes the uh, little dot here gets lost in the pixels, but that's going to be our notation. So dx dt will have a dot on it, dy dt will just be a y with a dot on it. This is what I call shorthand notation. Okay, it's pretty standard, so we'll, we'll, we'll make use of it. So, um, and let's, let's move some of these other guys along here because we're really going to need these other screens here uh, to um, help us with some of the uh, stuff that's coming in the quantum section here. So, uh, now, um, I often have a derivative with some, with some other parameter, in which case a prime might be called, and I have a prime on each one of those things. So that's, that's a, a notation that we'll be uh, wrestling with uh, from time to time here. The main thing I want to get to now is on the far screen there, and I'm going to put it on this one too. But before I do that, let's go up one more line here. And there's our symmetry relation. Now this is a real shorthand notation. If you're taking a, a EM course with Jackson, well, that's uh, pretty much the thing. Just a subscript means a partial derivative. And you're going to see that if you go into well, relativity, particularly general relativity. That's that's one of the notations, anyway, uh, that is uh, used. Okay, now, um, oh yes, there's one other thing. The, the standard Gibbs notation, and we're going to be uh, dealing with that at next week when we talk about complex variables uh, applied to physics. And uh, this little dot product right here between the differential x and y and the... Um, the uh, uh, well, del, del of some function of x and y, which is what we're talking about here. Okay, so th this, just to make sure that that's uh, up to date, uh, trying to get everything up to date in Kansas City here, and then this is what we've got to talk about. This is where it all begins, if you're just doing the classical shtick. Um, Lagrangian is an explicit function of velocity. That's sort of a canonical statement. And that's the thing about classical mechanics. You keep hearing about canonical variables. And you have to ask, what does the Pope have to do with all of this? This goes way back into history, where something was canonical, was blessed by the Pope. Well, these are the days when we don't respect, as a, as a society, as much the idea of canonical. In any case, you're going to hear it used in any text that you read or any paper that you read so written by somebody that's, written, that's about as old as I am will be using that terminology. Now, what you won't see very often is the guy that we uh, put in between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian. So, uh, what we've uh, uh, done when we talked about this was We've got an ellipse for the velocities of the SUV and the uh, Volkswagen, or the, uh, the uh, Super Bowl and the pen that was riding and colliding with it. Uh, that was our space, was the two uh, uh, velocities in, in the problem. And Lagrange, uh, the French approach to mechanics, based on velocity uh, very much. Um, and then on the other side of the, uh, the gulf between uh, Britain and Ireland uh, is the Hamiltonian. This is the Irish uh, approach to uh, a classical mechanics in which uh, we work with momentum. So the energy being expressed in terms of momentum, this one the energy expressed in terms of velocity. Okay. That's all you got in most of the mechanics things. We added this one, and uh, we're going to play with it a little bit, but not so much today. So these two are going to be played against each other. This was a convenient one for our geometry. 
because uh, ellipses became circles. That was really all there was to it. Okay, but that's a lot. In any case, uh, here, this matrix that has, and for our uses, is diagonal. But later on, when we talk about angular velocity, it'll be full of numbers on all sides, and it'll be three by three. Okay, so that's coming up, in, uh, not right away, but in, not too far from here. Anyway, uh, the same thing's true for the inverse of this matrix, which is what the Irish Hamilton uh, crew would be using. So uh, M inverse is the uh, key uh, quadratic form uh, that uh, describes energy in that uh, way of looking at things. Okay, now here's what we try to make the try to make the logic of all of this uh, have some some bite to it. Um, and this is where you get in trouble in thermodynamics if you don't take advantage of this. So uh, it's worth uh, looking here. Now, <clears throat> if we were going to fuss around with the um, the, uh, uh, the Astrangian, uh, we would make a point of saying that the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian had no dependence on that weird variable that I, what do you want to call it, speedinium or speedinium, okay, the thing where you had the square root of the masses uh, times the uh, was ordinary velocity, you had the half power of the quadratic form uh, times the velocity. Now, as I say, we're, we're not going to go into that one very much, but these two we really need to make uh, clear uh, what we demand from the uh, calculus of this. We want the Lagrangian, and if you're going to do Lagrangian, we want it too, but here we want the Lagrangian to have no explicit dependence on momentum. And then the iris says, no, I'm going to work with energies on I have no explicit dependence on velocity. Well, who's on, who, who's wrong? Well, they're both right. That's what we're going to try to make. So we write the zeroth equations for mechanics as far as the French are concerned, the Lagrange uh, is concerned. The partial derivative of L with respect to P is identically three equal signs, zero energy uh, the, the same way. So uh, that is the starting point for the Lagrange thing. This is the starting point for the Hamiltonian, and that is that the Hamiltonian shall not ever be an explicit function. What's this explicit function? We're going to have to explain that. That's going to take some explaining. But um, uh, same with energy. Uh, we don't want any uh, dependence in the formal sense of the uh, velocity variable. Okay. Well, uh, what do you do when something like that is uh, going on? And that's uh, the rest of this. Uh, uh, right here, and I'll go ahead and put this one up uh, in the same position. Okay. So by demanding this set of equations here, that is the partial with respect to v, and that's the expression we're going to use for the Lagrangian, and this is its uh, derivative with respect to velocity. Well, uh, what do you have? Uh, P here. Uh, take the the uh, m dot v. Okay, we can take the partial derivative with respect to v of this thing uh, in this vector notation, you get p. And the same thing's true uh, down here in the Hamilton world. When I uh, take the partial with respect to p of this quadratic form, well, I get a linear form. Okay, and that happens to be the velocity. So, you could say, well, now I understand all of the calculus uh, dependencies uh, from classical mechanics. Not quite, not quite. Something's weird going on here because we know darn well that when I change V in something that involves uh, Hamilton's work or I change P in something that involves Lagrange's work, it's going to change. But we were speaking of some kind of formal uh, uh, thing here, so canonical. Well, we've got to justify that canonical. We've got to have more uh, than just an edict from the Pope of what they used to be called a papal bowl. Okay. We need more, less bull in the description of this crazy stuff. Okay, so uh, that's what we're after. Now, <clears throat> as uh, we're going to see on page uh, 
about 28 or so. The non-dependency due to stationary value effects is what is behind this on the classical sub. It's called a contact uh, geometry, uh, which we're going to have to uh, uh, look at uh, more closely uh, very shortly here. So let's just remind us what the geometry looks like. When we uh, plotted the quadratic forms, we got ellipses. In the case of the quadratic form that involved the quadratic velocity, that was a velocity space. So these were the variables we were working with. In the background, we noted that uh, this is a, a p variable, but the explicit dependence is to v. And uh, v happens to be p over m, just as the p's happen to be what you're more used to, m times v. And uh, it's this geometry uh, that is uh, so key uh, to uh, understanding cl uh, more clearly uh, the dependencies, the, the crazy sort of dependency uh, behavior uh, that uh, uh, we're messing with right here. So this is the, go ahead and go right to the meat of this with all of the uh, uh, equations uh, that we've um, so far uh, demanded. We haven't really deduced, but uh, we're making uh, some sort of axiomatic uh, uh, calculus approach here. The first equation of Lagrange is just that p, the, the actual p vector, and, and, and this, this picture that I'm drawing here is weird, because what I'm doing is I'm drawing the Irish diagram that involves the momentum on top of the French diagram over here that uses velocity. Okay? But that's what we do with quadratic forms. We forget for a moment uh, the, the physics a little bit and just look at the geometry. So what I'm saying is that this P, this P momentum uh, right here is the gradient of the Lagrangian. There's a Lagrangian right there and it's a V dependency so I apply that and I get a vector. The gradient of the Lagrangian right there is P. Okay, there he is, the gradient. Perpendicular, that's a little perpendicular sign, right? And there's P right there. And then there's the flip side of that, which we've been through this already, uh, but it, it's weird, it's interesting to see it in this diagram. We're going to make a lot of use of this diagram when we come to uh, rotations and things like that. But before that, we will be messing with it. Here, velocity, that's the uh, first equation of Hamilton. And, P gradient of, of the Hamiltonian is going to be the velocity. Okay, whatever the velocity is. Well, there's the P gradient right there, perpendicular, you see, to the tangent. And there it is, that when its uh, butt is put on the origin where it belongs. Okay? Is this making sense? All right, this is the key uh, sort of thing. Now, how do you scale these? We did a little bit of fooling around with the scaling of quadratic forms. If I talk about a, a lesser mass, okay, then the, this guy shrinks. If you recall, the uh, major axis, minor, minor axis, right, minor radius, which you call B, major radius, call it A, if it's an ellipse, A, B, ellipse, okay. Well, they got the square root of the mass in there. This thing has the square root of the inverse uh, in it. This thing right here. Now, it's very finely uh, written, but you recall that. So, it might look like this. It might look like this. In all cases, you see, the tangent is going to be perpendicular to the momentum, even if the ellipsis of, of the Lagrange is big. If it's smaller, it still works. It, it is, this is scaling independent. Okay, just a minor point, but one that's worth uh, keeping uh, uh, tie, ties on, okay? All right, now, what is it that we're actually looking at if I'm allowed to actually plot the values of, say, the Hamiltonian? That is, think of this as a great big sort of ornate bowl coming out of the, out of the screen. There's the lowest point. 
Uh, here's the point that's right on the board right now, and then above that would be more real estate on a parabola, elliptic paraboloid, right? Is this a pretty, pretty clear thing to, to imagine? That's what I want to imagine. I now want to look at the cross section of that and do this stuff all over again. Okay, that's what we're after here. So I'll leave that picture up and we'll go and do some other stuff on these two screens. So here we go, introducing Poincaré and Lagrange contact transformation between the two of them. Okay? Now th this is really squirrely. This beginning thing right here is, is really squirrely. We have much better derivations of what I'm about to show you here that will come, well, later in this lecture, but particularly in the next one coming, where we actually start to make generalized coordinates that work for us. But um, given this relationship of P is a quadratic form times V, good old momentum equal some mass thing, a matrix, a times the velocity vector, there's the inverse. And we presume that uh, we don't have any uh, singularities of that thing. If you do, you stop right there and don't do anything. But if you do have a, a, a valid quadratic form, that's what it looks like. And the equations that we've been writing so far um, mirror that and the same thing uh, for these. So, it, you might be tempted, as I say, to rewrite the Q forms in a simpler way. Why, why mess with Q forms? Well, why not let the, the Hamiltonian here just be, and this is M inverse P, that's V, just like P dot V. Or I could go and take this one uh, right here. M dot V uh, is P, so I could write it V dot P. And this is classical uh, physics here, so these commute. These are both the same numerically. So what I've done is numerically correct. Okay? But functionally, it sucks. Numerically correct, differentially wrong. Okay? So that's what we're, we're, we're going to be arguing about, is the differential uh, uh, um, behavior of this as well as the uh, uh, numerical uh, values of these functions. Uh, okay? Now, as I point out uh, there, uh, classical physics doesn't care about the order of P and V. If these were operators, it would very much so uh, depend on that, but not here. So what we do is we take sort of the halfway road here. I go and say, oh, I think I'll make this P dot V minus one half V dot P. See how that works. Okay? Well, one half V dot P is L. Okay, if you want to just consider the behavior with respect to V. Oh, you want to play Irish? Okay, you want to get into Hamilton's country? Okay, well, let's do P of V minus H of P. We can uh, have that as well. That would be the Lagrangian. Okay, now how does that work? How in the world does that work? Okay, now this, this is one of the most famous equations. This is the doorway to understanding how classical, whatever you want to call this thing, relates to the wave mechanics. And we'll see that uh, several times uh, 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 later. But this is one equation and this is the other. And um, we're going to, as I say, derive this other ways. But uh, let me point out, if I have a working laser pointer here, and I don't think I do. Not for the green, maybe for the purple. Let's see if we've got a purple. Yeah, purple one works good. And there's a lot of fluorescent dye in paper, so it makes it so white. So let me get this thing working. There we go. Right there is the Hamiltonian expressed in terms of Lagrangian. So right there is this quick. Now it looks a little different. I've got P with a superscripts and stuff like that. So I've got a P dot V. V is Q dot and then minus L, okay? So those, those are, that right there is the, I call it the Poincaré, the, the Poincaré is the one that really made a fuss about this. And then the very first equation, uh, gradient of H is equal to velocity is right here. In the notation that we'll be using when we use these kind of weird uh, generalized coordinates that you need to study relativity. 
Okay. Now that's the second equation right there. We'll get to that later. But for now, we've got the first equation for Lagrange, and this is the first equation for Hamilton. And this is the connection between those two uh, quantities. Now this is the full-blown thing which we're going to work out in a day or so here. But the, right now we're just messing with the functional dependence of these uh, objects. So, uh, the explicit dependency or non-relations gives the right derivatives. It, it, this is a good choice. You can see right away if I take the partial derivative with respect to P of this side right here, and then I do a partial derivative of uh, with respect to P of that thing, I just get a nice uh, a V there, okay, V, right, and then minus, I take the partial of that respect to P, that's supposed to be legitimate to do. There's your Hamilton first equation, right there. V equal gradient of H. Same thing here, I go and take the partial derivative of V with respect to this, that's zero by definition here, and then these uh, work out to the, that's the first uh, Lagrange equation, I'm sorry, this is the first Hamilton equation, this is the first Lagrange equation. Okay? Alright, that's, that, that's basically uh, what it is uh, that we're playing with uh, in these uh, pictures right here. Okay? That's the first of these equations. So let's, uh, I'm going to bring this uh, screen uh, uh, here. Let's leave the one that has that kind of geometry on it up, and I'll jump ahead here on this screen up there. We don't need the astrongian anyway, so I'm going to bring this guy up to where we are. Whoops, I went too fast. Okay, That's what we really want to look at there. That's next. But um, I'll leave the, uh, the algebra for the time being on that screen there. And then I just touched something there that made this one move, and I didn't need to do that. Okay, so there's the basic algebra, and there they are on the wall. As us, um, some uh, deity has written them, and this, the, uh, just to remind you, the geometry uh, of these things, the tangents where they are and all of that. Okay? Now, here's what it looks like. Here's what that thing on the... Uh, the, 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 the V1 versus V2, or the P1 versus P2 uh, graph of ellipses looks like turned on the side, okay? So you have to imagine how an ellipse is edge on here, okay? We're we'll looking at a particular point on an ellipse that comes out of the board, goes back in, and goes into the board, and so forth, okay? So there's your parabola part of the elliptic paraboloid, okay? And here's the one that Hamilton's offering you. This is Lagrange over in uh, Paris. And here we are in Dublin with Mr. Hamilton. Uh, he's, that's what he's going to plot as his function of... Now, he works with momentum. He doesn't work with velocity. Okay? But look at the incredible relationship between these two. Okay? This is called cultural intersectionality okay? between the French and the Irish. Okay? So, what, what we got here? Okay, notice that the slope, that's this thing right here, the slope, the V slope, is P over there. Here it's 1.6, 1, 1. okay? That, the V slope, that, this thing is 1.6. You can see that it's 1 out and down uh, here to 0. 0.6. So, there's 1.6 in distance right there. And then there's this, and it's got a, uh, a, a positive slope, plus. All right? So there's that 1.6, there's the 1. Again, this is all a nice graph paper that you do that. Okay? So the connection is that the V slope intercept, this is where this, this guy meets, right here, is minus 0 0.6. 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. Okay, down, minus. Okay? The V slope intercept is equal to the Hamiltonian at the co corresponding point. Okay? The, the corresponding Hamiltonian at this point is 0. 0.6, matches the intercept except for a, a minus sign. And then the reverse term, the P slope intercept, that's this P slope line right there, is minus 1.0. 
okay? And that P slope inner slope is the value of the Lagrangian. That's this value uh, right there, okay? The value of the Lagrangian. Let's see if I, I've got that right. The Lagrangian L of V, that's this distance right here, is minus the P slope uh, 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 intercept, which is minus a minus is plus one. Okay? So I've carefully drawn arrows between very different geometrical um, concepts that are equal in num number uh, from Irish to French uh, way of doing things. So once again, here are the actual velocity, which the Lagrangian is a function of. It's equal to the p-slope. That's the first equation of Lagrange. Okay? Uh, take it back. That's the first equation of Hamilton. And then this one is the per first equation. The v-slope is the momentum. Okay, so this slope of 1.6 is the momentum value. Okay? That's a lot to sort of swallow at once, but that is our, that is the situation in classical mechanics. Okay? Let me go ahead and make sure it's on this screen as well. Okay? Now, I'd like to show you something. It's way ahead. It's unit 8. But this is where it comes from. This is where, in just using the waves in one axiom, the speed of light is constant, speed of light is a 45 degree line on the scale here, and we're talking about energy versus per space. That's per time. Energy is frequency. Uh, per space, inverse space, is momentum. How many wrinkles do you have in time? How many wrinkles do you have in space? That's uh, what waves deal with, and that's what quantum waves deal with. So. What I'd like you to just see for a brief moment here, and you just, if you're really interested, you go, go for it right now. But this, this is what is available to you if we're on the uh, web, and all you have to do is move the mouse to make the thing bigger, and then you can go and you grab one of these circles and try different values. I mean, you can start off right here where you can't see anything, but as you go, you make the momentum bigger. I'm point, pointing the arrow right there at the end of the momentum line, the P line, if you will. And uh, I am making the Hamiltonian, this is the relativistic Hamiltonian, exact for, well, what? For a box of light that has this much mass. This is mc squared from there to there. And then this is the dispersion curve for a wave in a waveguide. If you've been studying electromagnetism a little bit, you know that's the thing. Meanwhile, this thing is the Hamiltonian function of momentum. That's the Irish. The French is in this little circle. You know how the French are so urbane? You know, they're, they live in nice villages, right? And they kind of... Um, make fun of the people that are out in the country, okay? This is the Lagrangian right here at that particular setting. And this is the group velocity, that's the classical velocity of this uh, uh, funny uh, relativistic thing. And, and it never can exceed C. So this is, this is where the high energy physicists live. They live with Lagrangians because Lagrangians are nice and small. Meanwhile, the Hamiltonian is out of here. The Hamiltonian has no limit, it just goes to infinity. So, we, in this laboratory, we are all within a pixel of this point right here. Very seldom do we have any energy that is anywhere near the size of the rest mass of whatever it is we're working with. So, you're stuck in, you know, as long as you stay with us and don't go over to work at the collider or someplace. And if you work at the collider, you're down here you know, crunch down into there, okay? So th this is where that idea of those two equations is just a result of what waves do. And what you've got here is a slope, that's this blue line, okay, whose 
intercept sits right next to the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian has a slope. And the Lagrangian is nothing but a circle. The Lagrangian is sitting right here with its slope coming up and contacting the axis, and intercepting the axis at the Hamiltonian. Now you're amongst very few people in the world that have seen this structure. Are you happy about that? Or are you mad? I don't think this could possibly be. Right? It is. It is. It exists. Okay. And when you play with this thing, you can turn on uh, everything if you want to. It's all ways to approach this. Let's just turn everything on so that you see what is in there is a space-time graph, actually it's the per-space, per-time graph, and it is doing the usual Minkowski uh, thing that happens where you make a space-time graph of something that's going uh, well, it'll tell you up here what your uh, V over C is. That's about 0.6 the speed of light right there. Okay? Well, this is something worth thinking about. This is the way you can get your mind around what we call modern physics. And it goes back to Thales, 600 BCE. There's no geometry in there that you can't, uh, that Thales would be uh, uh, surprised by. He just wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about when it comes to physics. That took a lot longer for us to discover. Okay, so here's just a sketch without going to high speeds. There's what it looks like for any speed. Now, let's go back to this because this isn't a quantum mechanics class and I'm going to just back out of it for right now and take on uh, the things that uh, think. It, it, and this being a main point, all you need to say is all colors go the same speed. All of this geometry falls out. This is a really simple axiom. All the momentum conservation, all the energy structure, everything falls out. So I consider that a logical success when we can get something so complicated that it requires graduate school to learn, reduced uh, to a um, really beautiful way to learn about the hyperbolic functions or the circular functions. Use either one. There's a um, thing called the stellar aberration angle. That's the polar angle of the Lagrangian. It's all child's play when we do it this way. And that's the way physics should be. If you're really making success, uh, you try to make it. So this, on the other hand, is a little bit challenging. So uh, let's put away the thing that makes sense and get something up here that doesn't make quite as much sense, uh, at least not unless you look at it carefully. So here's where we're going to figure out what it really means to have no e explicit dependence on a velocity in a Hamiltonian. Then we'll play the same trick on the Lagrangian. Okay. Using that cross section that I had there, forgetting about the fact that there's an MC squared thing that has to be added to all of this stuff that is the fundamental heartbeat of all matter. But um, we'll just go ahead and pretend that we can get away with our work putting the energy at any point. And you know that's kind of true because nothing that you measure depends on the energy value. It's always the difference or derivative of that energy that you measure. You can put your zero anywhere you want until you get into the relativity and say, oh, i got to put it at mc squared. Then, then it nails you. But for this class, put your energy uh, origin anywhere you want. Okay? Differences are the only thing that matters. Okay, so what do we got here? What I've got is a bunch of secant lines. That's L 
as a function of v is equal to p dot v minus something called h. Well, here's h. It's an intercept, okay? And I'm just playing around with the intercept. Now, I'm trying uh, certain values. v of minus 2 gives me an intercept, uh, uh, you know, right there. Okay, v of mi minus 1 gives me an intercept right there. And so forth, okay? Until finally, I'm off the curve. The tangent doesn't touch the curve anymore, right? So I back up. That's the point I'm interested in right there. That's where the tangent line points to the extreme value of h on this axis. And at that point, the derivative of, Hamil of the Hamiltonian with respect to velocity is zero. So there's the functional picture for just a classical way to approach this subject, uh, giving us what we have been assuming, uh, sort of. Uh, 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 as we go here, okay? So the contact point that has the maximum h, this is an extremum problem, and at that point, the partial derivative of h with respect to v, or if we only had the variables shown, the derivative with respect to v is absolutely zero. It, you know, the, that's the way you find maximum and minimum extreme values, right? To set the derivative to zero. Well, here's a pretty fancy version of that idea. Okay? Now the next one on the list here, you see, this is uh, really stating uh, what it is I'm after here to make this, or let's do this one. Okay? Well, you know, it's the same, it's the same story. The same story is going to come up on there. So, um, it's re rephrasing it at the very bottom of this uh, thing here. This deri zero derivative at each point, v, of the Lagrangian, where your slope varies, okay, but varies from point to point. When you're on a particular point, okay, uh, this, uh, this Hamiltonian has, n has no uh, variability uh, and, uh, <clears throat> unless I cheat and make two points. And that's not uh, what we're uh, doing. Okay, so here's the Lagrangian story. Okay, same deal. Okay, secant lines on the Irish curve, the Hamiltonian curve, function momentum. Okay, and the intercepts are L, and it's reaching an extremum. Okay, and at that point, we've got this situation. That's how you get this partial derivative of L of P is equal to zero. I haven't seen this anywhere except of the slight approach to this in Arnold's book. Arnold is um, a famous Russian. Um, the Russians are way ahead of the Americans on uh, mechanics. They were the ones that brought us the analysis of chaos. Kolmogardov, Arnold, Moser. The KAM theorem of, of classical chaos is, is legendary, and that was all being worked out in the late uh, 70s, 80s, 90s. Okay. But except for the Arnaud's book, I, there was, he didn't go into this detail. He really just kind of drew a, a, a funny sketch and then stopped. So, one of those things that um, we're getting in this room that uh, you don't find outside of this room that much. Okay. Now, um, I'd like to take a, a, a quick analogy here, uh, just for the uh, sake of, uh, if you're taking thermodynamics or statistical mechanics with thermodynamics, uh, you've probably seen where you take the internal energy, and that has to be, is, 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 is written on a gold tablet somewhere, that that, that particular internal energy uh, as most people do it, is a function of entropy, S, and volume, V. And this is a two-dimensional, very simple a thermodynamic system. But I make an analogy here with, their, um, with our velocity versus momentum. A new function called enthalpy has a different, I uh, think it has a letter H, first of all, here. Uh, that's what enthalpy is usually designated by. And it is still a function of entropy, but now it's pressure. Okay, so here we got these two different situations. 
that are analogous to the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian differing uh, in their uh, kinetic variable, the velocity in one case and the momentum in the other case. So, uh, what do you get? There is a thing called the Legendre transform. Legendre was doing more than just mechanics, and uh, that's uh, a French school again. Uh, here he writes, and he writes the enthalpy as a product of pressure and volume, those two variables that we're trying to switch, and the internal energy. Okay? So this is very much like our uh, Poincaré relation, in, uh, except for a minus sign there. That, that, that. And he gets a new variable here. The pressure is minus the partial derivative u with respect to v. And there's that little s subscript that you would find in, in a lot of thermodynamics saying, don't move that variable. It's only partial with respect to v. Okay? So, uh, that's, that's what I'm uh, trying to show here. Now, just put in different names here. Let this be the Lagrangian of a position and velocity, and it's kind of nice that the v of volume is a, uh, just the capital of, a, of, a, of the velocity variable here, okay, is defined as a function of entropy, well, position r and volume v, okay, and then we get this, this uh, Hamiltonian is analogous to enthalpy, which depends still on entropy, that means still on position r, but we're changing v to p, okay, and there's a relationship right there, and this is the pressure, this is the equation, with a minus sign. So you see the difference here is that we've got a minus, and that makes sense for us to have that. Uh, and you can see that maybe in the geometry that was there, but I didn't go into that. But um, here we got a plus sign. So there's an example of these things. So except for the plus and minus signs, our Hamiltonian going from Lagrangian, in other words, if you know the Lagrangian, this is how you get the Hamiltonian, and you do it all the time, no matter how many variables you have. This is really a a golden relation. We'll see why it is. It's because of the underlying phase of quantum mechanics that makes classical mechanics work, ultimately. We've got this momentum here that uh, we were talking about. Okay, does that, these are things I'm, I'm putting up here to help you with other subjects, but mechanics, we really need this stuff. To, we need to understand it as clearly and solidly as possible. Okay? Now, the whole idea of a contact transformation is also a deep one. And then we're going to go back to sophomore physics today. Okay, so the, 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 the remaining uh, 30 to 40 minutes of the class will be a relief. Quite unlike the last lecture where it was just the opposite. Okay, so first I want to show you what this looks like in general. And then I want to show you a sophomore physics problem that uses this. So, um, to get ready for that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this uh, screen ahead uh, as well to about where we are. In fact, I might just take it right over the edge. That's what we're looking at uh, in general, is a general contact transformation. Now this started out, I think, in the... Um, olden times, okay, we're talking before you had, had the graph paper and all that kind of stuff, but the ability to draw curves, uh, this is a neat way to do it if you can pull it off. And the idea is, you've got a curve here in the variables y and x lowercase, and we're, we've got a contact transformation generator function. Uh, this is going to be called our action function in our mechanics. And I'm using the letter S, which is very often used to label action. And action turns into quantum phase when you make the connection. So we're, we're getting here at something that is what waves do perhaps first of all in uh, your physics knowledge. Huygens' principle is a really good example of that. We have a bunch of emitters, da -da -da -da, they're making spherical waves, right? And each spherical wave goes out and has an extrema. That extrema is called a cusp, or the, there's another name for it, I can't think of it right now. Um, bonk, bonk, bonk. I'll think of it later. 
But anyway, that's the wave front created by all the little wavelets. Okay? That's what this is, except it's just a mathematical a structure here. I give you a function of both variables, set it to a constant, okay? and then each time I have a point here, I then go over here and plot all the possibilities uh, for that, this, this, uh, this function right here. I look at this function, like I'm actually looking at this one, I look at that, said so it was a constant, so it's 10 in each of these cases, okay? I look at this thing, uh, I know what this value is, so I simply plot S of big X and big Y in the big X, big Y graph paper, okay? So I go like that, okay? Well, that doesn't help you much. That says that this point maps to all of these points. Hmm. It doesn't help me much, does it? Then I go on to the next one. Okay, this point right here. I look at this equation for x1, y1, which is right here. Well, it does the same thing. Uh, this thing equal to 10, uh, the big x and big y, uh, lies on that curve right there. Okay. And then I do it one more time, say up here. Same thing now, except it is x2, y2, little x2, y2, giving me all of these points. Then I say, I don't give a crap about all these points. I like this little thing that's forming right here, the wave front. That's the contact transformation curve of this curve. And that, you can see why it's called the contact transformation. It's because it's all the contact points. That's the general case. Okay. Now, what we just discussed was a Legendre transformation. It was this one? It's a contact transformation where all of the contact groups are straight lines. That's a pretty special case of the of the, of this. Okay. And it gives us the equations that we have: h equal q dot p minus l. Remember, q dot is the velocity in the notation that we're going to be using fairly shortly. We get out of this uh, out of this elementary review unit, but um, that is the geometry. Now, if in fact I take this curve and go dip line dip line dip line, you can see how having a bunch of lines, and you wouldn't draw the whole line; you just draw little segments of it, would really be a powerful way to get a precise mapping curve. Better than what we've been doing where we get a point. Here you get a whole line and the point. Okay, so that it's an artistic graphics ruse. It's a, it's a, it's a tool.